Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 36, The Aftermath of Poltava and the Disaster at Pruth. The Battle of Poltava in one sweeping motion ended the Swedish invasion of Russia, but it did much more than that. All in Europe were expecting Russia to be defeated, Peter dethroned, and Russia carved up by the Swedes, Poles, Turks, Tatars, Cossacks, and even the Chinese. Poltava changed that scenario completely. From the day after the victory at Poltava, countries throughout Europe had to mind what Russia was doing when planning their nation's future. The balance of power had moved east in a big way. Last week, I also said that this episode would deal with uh, Peter the Great's disappointment with his son Alexis. I jumped the gun a little bit, and we'll deal with that painful issue next episode. Charles, for his part, had to stay out of Russian hands and headed out of Poltava with a small force of 900 Swedes and 2,000 Cossacks and headed south toward the Bug River to seek sanctuary with the Ottomans. The rest of the Swedish army, numbering 14,000 with 5,000 Cossacks by their side, wearily retreated separately. By the end of June, they were met by 6,000 of Menshikov's dragoons and 2,000 loyal to the Tsar Cossacks. Despite having numerical superiority, the Swedes were beaten men, so on July 1st, General Lohenhaupt surrendered. The Cossacks who remained with the Swedes were summarily killed as their acts were considered treason. Now the race was on to capture Charles and the Cossack hetman Ivan Mezpa. 6,000 Russians, led by Volkonsky, raced toward the Bug River. They arrived in time to capture 300 Swedes, but Charles and Mespa had already crossed into Turkish territory. The Swedish king, whose grand army had started with over 40,000 men when they invaded Russia, now numbered a mere 600. Now it was time for Peter to reap the rewards of victory. To say that sentiment in Europe changed toward Russia would be a gross understatement. Letters and proposed t treaties came from everywhere, including Prussia and Hanover, and even an alliance was proposed from none other than ki the King of France, Louis XIV. Russia was now recognized as a world power. Peter arranged for his son Alexis to marry Charlotte of Wolfenbüttel with his niece Anna daughter of his late brother Ivan, to Duke Frederick William of Courland, a nephew of Frederick I, the King of Prussia. Because Russia was now a European power, dynastic marriages, unknown for hundreds of years there, would transform the country, speeding its westernization. Before any major celebrations could be attended to by Peter, there were still some territories that he needed to regain. One part of his army, led by Menshikov, headed to Poland to reseat Augustus to the throne. The Swedish army in Poland retreated, knowing they had little chance against the vastly larger Russian army. That and their king and leader was nowhere to be found. Shermatev headed to Riga to lay siege to the town that had treated Peter so poorly at the start of his great embassy. The general, though, was told not to fire on the city until Peter arrived, as the Tsar wanted the pleasure of firing the first cannon shots at the city, which he did in November of 1709. Preparations were now being made for a grand celebration in Moscow, where Peter now headed to. On his way, he learned news that his beloved wife Catherine, who was still not publicly acknowledged, but had given birth to a daughter, Elizabeth, who would one day rule in Moscow. When Peter arrived in, in the city, the parties were of a magnitude not seen before, with a fireworks display that rivaled any the world had seen to date. All the generals were given grand rewards and promotions. The captured Swedes were now paraded through the streets, somewhat reminiscent of ancient Roman triumphs. Interestingly, the captured officers, some 2,000, were offered positions in the Russian army, although far away from their homelands, with many sent to Siberia. Some escaped and headed back to Sweden. Others who refused army service became merchants or craftsmen, blending into the countryside, many marrying Russian women and converting to Russian orthodoxy. <laughs> 
For the common soldier, no such magnanimous offers were forthcoming. Many were sent to work in the mines in the Urals, where they were to die as virtual slaves. Others were offered service in the Russian army to help fight remnants of the Kuban Tatars, while some were sent to St. Petersburg to help build the city. Of the 40,000 who joined Charles XII on his invasion of Russia, only 5,000 eventually returned to their native Sweden. One thorn in Peter's side was the small buffer between his soon-to-become capital of St. Petersburg and the Swedes who held Finland. First, Vyborg was laid siege to and fell on June 13, 1710, which gave the Russians a hundred-mile buffer. Next, Shermatev finally ground down the garrison in Riga by pounding it with over 8,000 shells. By July 10th, they too had surrendered. What Peter did next really showcased how he had become an enlightened ruler when he offered the people of the Baltic region the right to keep everything. They could keep their Lutheran religion and their language, which at the time was German, and all their property. All this was allowed just for the exchange for a pledge of loyalty to Russia. There were no complaints. Now, with the Swedes in descent, an old enemy began to rise up. That enemy was the Ottoman Empire. Luckily for the Russians, the peace treaty they signed in 1700 held through their war with Sweden, which was lucky for Peter, as a combined force would have easily defeated the Russians. The Tsar now aimed at expanding his realm south, sensing a weakness in the Muslim Empire after a succession of weak sultans and a revolving door of second-hand men known as the Grand Vizier. The reason Peter knew so much was because of his ambassador, when Peter Tolstoy, who was the mouthpiece of the Tsar at the capital of the Ottoman Empire at Constantinople. With Charles XII under the Sultan's care and protection, palace intrigues abound. Peter wanted Charles, and he told, told Tolstoy that he was to demand the Swedes' expulsion and deliverance into Russian hands. This constituted an insult to the Sultan, who began to listen to the advice of his mother, Charles, and a person who despised Peter and all the Russians, the Crimean Tatar Khan, Devit Garay. Garay was still smarting from the defeats he suffered at the hands of the Russian army and the signing of the Treaty of Constantinople in 1700, whereby the Sultan agreed to suspend the demand for Russian tribute to the Khan and the promise to stop raids into the Ukraine by the Tatars. Garay begs the Sultan to break the peace and declare war, which the supreme leader of the Turks did on November 21, 1710. In January... Of 1711, the attack began with an army of 200,000 led by the Grand Vizier. Peter was flushed with overconfidence, though, after Poltava, where he actually acted cautiously. He should have reined in his enthusiasm. He was hit by illness almost immediately, also suffering a major seizure. He recovered in time to sign the agreement with the Duke of Wolfenbüttel for his daughter to marry Alexis. With mind clear, he prepared for battle. Peter's belief was that once he marched into the Balkans, which was under control of the Turks, the Christian armies would jump at the opportunity to throw off the yoke of the Muslim overlords. This was a daring, highly dangerous, and quite presumptuous belief, as there wasn't a clamoring for switching sides, although the Serbs were overjoyed at the prospect, which would lead to centuries of bonds with the Russians that would show up as late as the late 20th century in the war surrounding the breakup of Yugoslavia. Peter believed he could penetrate deep into Turkish territory and smash the Turks to bits and force them to hand over Charles. This reckless attitude was to lead to an almost completely disastrous battle known as the Pruth Campaign. The Russian army was totally unprepared for the size and readiness of the Turkish army. The Grand Vizier and the Sultan had invited Charles to tag along to watch them smash the Russians. But for some unknown reason, Charles declined, some think in part due to his ego, which wouldn't allow him to be merely present and not in the lead. This was to prove to be a bigger mistake than the invasion of Russia had been. The Moldavians eagerly joined the Russian army, but they were smored compared to the Wallachians, 
It is the latter who betrayed Peter after agreeing to side with him, which placed the whole of the Russian army in a bad situation. In late June, the Russians had settled by the Pruth River, exhausted but sure that the Wallachian army would be there shortly to support them. By July, Peter and his army, numbering 38,000, found themselves, due to the defection and numerous blunders, surrounded by the entire Ottoman army of 200,000. Hundreds of cannons surrounded the Russians, pointing directly at the infantry. The Tsar was trapped, and he knew it. He knew he needed to see, sue for peace or face utter destruction, which would mean all of Russia would be open for the taking, as it would likely fall to the Muslims. He sent out emissaries to negotiate with the Grand Vizier, but not before intense fighting had occurred. July 10, 1710, should have been the end for Peter, and likely an end to an independent Russia. He sent out Shermatev to offer huge concessions, including the return of Azov, Livonia, whatever the other side wanted, including Peskov. Negotiations went back and forth, with Khan Garay furiously demanding that the attacks renew. But much to the incredible surprise to Peter, the Turks just wanted a few concessions, such as the return of Azov and the destruction of the fortress at Tagnarog. Stanislaus Poniatowski, an agent of Charles, quickly sent a message to the Swedish king, who arrived on the 13th, aghast at the sight of the last of the Russian columns retreating. He begged the Grand Vizier to attack. The man would have none of it, as he had won the battle without much bloodshed, and he knew he could ill afford to lose any troops, as there was a threat to the West in Austria, and that in a separate operation that even Peter was unaware of, Russian General Rohn had defeated a Turkish army in Bralia. The Turks also received a number of other concessions from the Tsar, such as a promise to abandon Poland, but still, this was considered minor by Peter. How dismayed Charles must have been, knowing that had he accepted the invitation to appear in the beginning, he may have persuaded his host to destroy Peter and restore all Sweden had lost and gained so much more. It's really amazing to think how the world as we know it would have changed had Charles made a different choice than to not go to the Battle of Pruth early on. Russia likely would have been carved up by their neighbors, the Crimean Tatars would have re-enslaved the people, and the country would have likely ceased to exist in any shape that we would recognize today. Peter was extremely lucky that he was able to escape the inescapable predicament he put himself into. It took three more wars that were declared by the Turks due to Peter's procrastination in turning over Azov and Tognarog, and his refusal to leave Poland. But the Turks had no stomach for war, as on October 18, 1713, the Treaty of Andianople was signed and the Russians finally abandoned Azov. The loss was crushing, as Peter had lost his port to the south, as well as having to destroy all his southern ships, some of which he had built with his own hands. But he knew that it could have been much, much worse. He would, as always, learn from the defeat and rebuild once again. Next week, we'll continue the saga of the life of Peter the Great with the German campaigns, Peter's visit to Paris, and then we will finally discuss the disappointment Peter was to experience with his son, the Tsarevich Alexis. Now, for this week in Russian history, for the week of January 30th through February 5th. In 1218, Konstantin of Rostov, the Prince of Novgorod, died. In 1667, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth seceded, ceded Kiev, Smolensk, and the left bank of the Ukraine to the Tsardom of Russia and the Treaty of Andrusovo. Natalia Narashkina, Tsarista of Russia, mother of Peter the Great, died in 1694. In 1706, during the Battle of Fraustadt, Swedish forces defeat a superior Saxon-Polish-Russian force by deploying a double, double envelopment. In 1730, Tsar Peter II of Russia died. Russia established a fur trading colony at Fort Ross, California in 1812. In 1918, Russia adopted the Gregorian calendar. In 1929, the Soviet Union exiled Leon Trotsky. In 
1943, German Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus surrendered to the Soviets at Stalingrad, followed two days later by the remainder of his Sixth Army, ending one of World War II's fiercest battles. The Battle of Stalingrad comes to a conclusion as Soviet troops accept the surrender of the 91,000 remnants of the Axis forces. In 1989, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, the last Soviet armored column, left Kabul. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, don't forget to visit the iTunes App Store and download the Russian Rulers Podcast uh, app. Please visit the websites at russianrulers.podhoster.com and become a Facebook friend at Russian Rulers History Podcast. Don't forget to ask a question, make a suggestion, and please leave a comment. And as always, Dasvidanya i spasiba bolshoya.